Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks, uh, Nathan, for inviting me over to, to talk about CoreScan. This is something that has kind of consumed my life for the past couple of years. I, you know, I've been with SGS about 21 years. Uh, my background is essentially is, uh, I'm a geochemist and mineralogist, uh, and you know I've been managing labs, uh, geochemistry labs, uh, diamond lab, which was a lot of fun, um, and you know, but always involved in trying to to bring new technologies, new innovations to SGS because we, you know, we, we're a lab company among other things, and and it's always very good to sort of, it, you know, introduce new things, uh, be innovative because uh, that is how you sort of keep your company going and growing. Um, so when my diamond business collapsed in in the wake of the financial crisis, people ran out of money to sort of buy raw diamonds, and sort of things just came to a halt. There was one issue there that, that really was quite interesting. We were trying to figure out, you know, how you could measure diamond as using a grain size as a proxy. And I tried all sorts of things and we, we had access to QEM scans, which are micro scale, uh, uh, SEMs, and we never quite managed it. And somehow I stumbled on this technology and I thought it was something very, very useful. We're not a technology developer, so we went out there and looked into the marketplace and, and saw who was doing you know, what with this technology. But around 2012, we came across a company called CoreScan based in Western Australia. And uh, you know, looking at what they'd done, we, we thought that they had put, you know, got their act together and put a lot of different things together so that made this technology viable. Because hyperspectral technology, infrared technology, has been around for a long time. It's, you know, people have been using it uh, from satellites, airborne, all kinds of military applications uh, because it, it, it's not just minerals, it's uh, vegetation, it's uh, foodstuffs, there's a lot of application, pharmaceuticals among other things. Uh, but the application here to identify for, for mineralogy is, is uh, kind of interesting and it, it's, it's come as an outcome of the development of these sensors which are progress because of progress in military technology and some of these sensors became available in the last few years. So they've been able to, to use those sensors in a very innovative design. But, uh, okay. Uh, but the impetus for this technology has essentially been trying to get a better way of logging. Uh, now logging core is a very much a fundamental process in any exploration or mining endeavor because that is where when you drill down that is where you get the basic geological information that enables you to build a geological model and the basis of that geological model is how you sort of understand what is going on where to drill to to find uh, the ore or how to build your mine uh, but the issue with logging is that <laughs> it's not such a popular task it's very often given to very junior members of the team or, you know, where you have somebody experienced, you know, they're, they're few and far between. So when you're drilling thousands of meters, it's not always possible to, 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 for these uh, experienced people to log core. Uh, there are issues with mineral identification. Uh, if you have a, a log of minerals, you only see those minerals. And if there's something unexpected, you don't really see that. And very often you come across something like this where it's very difficult to identify anything, you know, even if you're an experienced logger. Um, and I'll show you later on, there's multiple things going on in this piece of rock where you don't actually see any minerals. So the, the, the uh, CoreScan came up with a system, an, an automated system that uh, is not only fast, but consistent and effective to be able to give you mineralogy that you can use uh, in your geological program, whether, whether, whether it's an um, exploration program or a mining program. But one of the other issues is that, you know, after you've drilled the core, you have to store it. And retrieving it is not, not always easy. I mean, you can go, as we did, to the US Geological Survey in Denver, where they have this vast core library. But the geologists uh, two blocks down didn't know what was in there. And there's some incredible core. And, you know, as geologists, we actually learn from what has gone on in other deposits to figure out what's happening in the deposit we happen to be exploring. Uh, the other issue more serious, I think, is for junior mining companies is a lot of core, when, particularly when it's mineralized, starts to deteriorate. Uh, and over time, it kind of, <laughs> you, you don't recognize very much in there. 
And you know, it can be argued that the value of many junior companies lies in the core that they, they get out of the ground. If you're, going, if you're going to try and sell that property to somebody uh, you know, for a billion dollars, you've got to be able to show them that the rock is there, that it contains these minerals, and that you can get gold or copper or whatever it is out of there. But if it's like this, you're not going to be able to do that. So there is good reason you know, to actually scan this core and have it available uh, in your archive to demonstrate the value of your project and also to archive this over time so that you can come back and retrieve it much more easily. So once it's digitized, it's much easier to, to come and look at this core again than trying to find the box in that, in that rack over there. Um, so the system that has been put together has multiple sensors. Uh, it takes photographs, very good digital photographs. It has uh, three hyperspectral cameras that are covering this range of 450 nanometers to 2500 nanometers. So that's a visible to near infrared to shortwave infrared. Uh, and that is where a lot of minerals have a response or absorption features, uh, mainly alteration minerals. Uh, now you can expand it and plans, there are plans to expand it to, to 12 millimeters where we can you know, identify a whole bunch of other minerals. But this range is very useful for a number of minerals that are important for uh, finding ore deposits or vectoring to ore, or uh, you know, have a problem when you're, when you're processing the rock. Um, so the third thing they've added is, is a laser profiler uh, that actually measures morphology, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about what that does. Um, you, can, you, you can put in all si uh, sizes of core boxes, the longer Canadian ones are a bit of a problem, but we've sort of modified the system to be able to accept those. And you have fairly high throughput. If you're working 24, in 24 hours, you can process 1,000 meters. I did it again. OK. Um, so that uh, system is housed in a CCAN container, so it's, it's very mobile. You can take it. Uh, we have actually one, we just brought one into Toronto, but you can put it at, at, a, at a drill rig um, where you can uh, scan the core that is coming from the rig. And uh, you want your core to be clean and dry before you scan it. Um, so mobility was, was very important uh, for this unit. Also the ability to, you know, it just operates off, uh, off a genset. There's an, it's air conditioned inside, so there's constant temperature, so the infrared response is, uh, is uh, consistent. Uh, but it also incorporates a lot of QAQC to make sure that the signal uh, can always be corrected if there, were, if there are changes in the local atmosphere. Um, we can scan a lot of different types of uh, rock. Split core is best, but uh, very often what we're doing is we're on site where they're drilling, so you might have round core and you, 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 you're just scanning this, the top surface of it. In a mining situation, you might be looking at uh, MET samples or blast hole samples, and the idea there is to scan these things, find out what's in the miner mineralogy that could affect the processing, and adjust your processing circuit on the fly to, to, to accommodate variations in your ore body. And one of the things, again, that sort of drove me in this is we, we have a big geometallurgical group where we're looking at trying to optimize mining operations. Um, and you can do a lot of metallurgical measurements, but a lot of ore bodies these days are extremely variable. So to be able to find something that can cope with that variability and quickly, uh, you, need, you need something that operates in real time. And this system, you know, when it's all fully calibrated and has a very good spectral library, actually does operate in, in near real time. It does generate a huge amount of data. Within a couple of days, you have a terabyte of data. So processing is an issue. But as the computers are getting faster, we, we're able to deliver results faster. So right now, we can scan something at a site and have the results to the geologist in about three hours. Um, well, we, we can also do hand samples and chips and cuttings. That's very often used in the iron ore industry where you've got a lot of uh, sort of uh, you know, 100,000 tons per day, for example, being processed, and you can sort of have to make quick decisions as to what it is you want to process. Uh, this is what it looks inside. The, the spectrometers are housed in this unit over here. Um, we have this unit that swings out uh, that uh, does a quality control check 
before every row, of course. We're measuring reflection and we're measuring uh, spectral uh, measurements to, to, to calibrate the, the spectrum. And then we have high-speed data acquisition. And in some units where we're doing it in real time, we'll have a processing unit in there. Or else the data has to be shipped out to Perth. Uh, so every, every, that's where our main processing center is. Uh, so every couple of days, we'll ship out a hard drive, because that's fa the fastest way to get the data over. Um, so this is uh, the first product. This is photographic image. And you can zoom in and, and look at your core in great detail. Um, and look at textures and understand what is going on. Um, and because all of that is digitized, you can look at it at multiple scales. So you can look at it at the scale of the core box, or you can look at it as many geologists want to see it as, as a simple downhole segment to see sort of how textures are varying down the hole. Uh, or you can look at all the drilling you've done in, a, in an ore body. This is uh, something that Newcrest did in the Numosi Porphyry, which is a very big ore body in Fiji. And that picture of the unit was, a, on, was in Fiji at, at the drill site. And you see everything from an oxidized top uh, into different types of alteration. Uh, it's an ar advanced argillic alteration and potassic alteration. I'll try and keep the geological terms to a minimum. <laughs> but uh, to a porphyry geologist, that is very interesting because it tells you of the progression in terms of alteration and where it is you might find the ore. And I should add that most ore systems out there, yeah, I think the majority of them, are related to a process of alteration. So there are fluids moving through rock, and they're concentrating metals. And to be able to find where those concentrations of metals, you have to understand what the geological system is in there and, and, and try and you know, uh, find the directions in which these fluids were going and where, where these concentrations of metals. So understanding the alteration processes uh, is very important. And this is what you know, Corscan does very well. On a photographic image, you can see sort of uh, gross changes in the rock type. And you can zoom in and, and see, see what's happening in particular. And you're very in geologists are very interested in boundaries and so on be between different rock units. Um, so the second thing is this core morphology, which, is, uh, which we use for automated texture analysis. Uh, and, and what it... Uh, gives you is uh, rock quality designation, this RQD, which is, uh, tells you about the breakage in the rock. So you know, we, we use this classification of green is greater than 100 millimeters, blue is less than 100 millimeters, and red are broken regions. This is very important geotechnical information where you, in a mine you may have problems with uh, stability of the rock. Or you know, if you have a situation where uh, you're mining in situ. So there are a number of places like Arizona, a number of mines that are uh, looking at in situ leaching of copper. So you want to be able to understand what the breakages are in, in the rock and uh, you know, what the mineralogy associated with that is. Uh, so this gives you something called RQD. And it's, it's uh, very often something that logging geologists find very tedious to do. But it's an automated way of gathering RQD, roughness, and breaks per meter. And we g generate those numbers, which you can then put into your geotechnical software to work out uh, stability or whatever it is you need to do. Um, so metallurgical modeling that can be carried out on a consistent uh, data set. Do I go too far? No. Uh, so the, the, the third product is this hyperspectral imagery. And that's the main output that we're interested in. And that's what I, what I want to focus on for the rest of this uh, presentation. Uh, so what we're measuring in there is approximately 200,000 uh, pixels in a one meter of rock. Now, you know, geologists have been using handheld systems for, for quite a while because they've always appreciated the ability to, to identify minerals that they could not see very well. Uh, so you've had these handheld systems. And generally, what they do is probably one or two measurements uh, per meter of rock. But here, we're getting something like 200,000 signatures in there. And the signature looks something like this. is a spectrum. And each of these absorption features is, corresponds to a mineral. So you might have three or four different minerals in there. We develop a spectral library that we use to match this. Um, and we process uh, 
the information here to tell us something about the mineral, something about its uh, degree of crystallinity, which is a, a thermal parameter, and also um, something about the chemical shift in that mineralogy. So this, this, this is, in, there's an incredible depth of information that you're able to get out of these spectra. And you know, you're getting 200,000 per meter. So you can appreciate the kind of volume of data that you're getting uh, in, in, in the scanning. Um, the process data is, uh, sh comes out like this. So you would have the core photograph. You'd have a full hyperspectral response. And out of that, you can produce individual mineral maps. So here we have kaolinite. Um, and we have abundance. So we, red is high and blue is low. And that's normally how we show it. Um, I've been doing clay mineral analysis, I don't know, since I almost, I was in divers, I think. <laughs> and it's the most difficult thing to do. Uh, and clays, clays are a problem in every processing circuit, whether, whether you're in oil sands, whether you're in mineral processing, whether, you know, whatever it is, you, whenever you're trying to process rock, clays are a problem. And the issue is how, how, how can you identify them quickly? Uh, this technology does that, and it does that down to the species level. So it's incredible wealth of data in, in terms of that. You know, some of these clays, if you're a mineral processing engineer, you want to know if it's a swelling clay, if it's a, a Montmorillonite versus a kaolinite, and you want to know the distribution in there. Um, what we were able to do also then is show the mineral class map. So we've got the spectrum here. We've got multiple minerals. What we depict here is just the most important mineral. Uh, in this case, it's iron ore. It's kaolinite over here. Um, we do have some Montmorillonite in here. We've got alite in there. So very quickly, you're, you've built up a mineral, mineralogical map on wh what is going on. But more importantly for a geologist is you can start to see textures. And, and textures are very important because they tell you what is happening in the rock and potentially where, where the ore is. Um, so what we see this as a, as a fundamental innovation uh, in infrared spectroscopy. And you know, orders of magnitude increase in the amount of data that you're able to get out of the rock. If you're assaying data, you might get uh, you know, one or two, three elements that represent ore elements, but you know, potentially 40 elements and not often used. Uh, but all of these minerals are, are very important uh, and can be used for exploration targeting or for metallurgical modeling. Um, so, you know, what we have also developed as an aside is uh, processing systems that are able to take terabytes of data and actually get Im information that is relevant to your project, to, your, to the problems that you're facing. So if it's a geological situation, we'll sit down with our analysts and, and find out what is relevant and get that information and, and feed it to our geostatistical systems, uh, uh, which then sort of produce you know, relevant uh, numbers for whether or not you should be drilling in a further in a project or whether, whether you should be making changes in your processing circuit to accommodate the change in mineralogy that you see. Um, uh, and one point I always make is uh, I'm a geologist and very sensitive to the fact that <laughs> geologists kind of uh, it's, you know, not very stable at times. Uh, we're not displacing the logging geologist. <laughs> uh, the logging geologist now has a wealth of information to come up and actually use their understanding of what is going on to, to, to describe what is going on within, within an ore body. And so, you know, there's, they're doing a much more advanced task than they were just by looking at the tr rock and trying to decide what was there previously. This is what the logging geologist would see on their tablet is this hyperspectral overlay on a RGB image. So this is uh, mineral elite. And here we see an abundance of elite uh, over in one or two other fractures. Uh, in the next one, we have a different mineral. It's gypsum. And it's occupying a different set of fractures. And very quickly, you can build up a chronology from these cross-cutting relationships of uh, what has happened in the rock, so we call that a parigenesis in terms of the development of uh, the alteration systems or the fluids that were passing through there, and maybe direction as to where they might have gone and where your old body might lie. Um, so 
you know, this, this allows you to, to, to build a story of what is going on and build your geological model very quickly. Um, and all of this information is now is, you know, is processed and it's in, 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 in a cloud-based solution called CoreShed. Um, and that allows you to sort of manage your core. So you, you may not want to go totally with uh, physical storage because now you have digital storage. This, this, is, this data, this information is archived forever. You also get a copy back to, to, to sort of uh, have to play around if you, if you need to, but as, as uh, something that you can sort of dip into if you want to look at your core. And it's an inventory of, your, of, your, of the core that you've acquired in your program and allows you then to integrate that into third-party software. So there's easy, easy management of data. So you've got your assay data, your geophysical data, which uh, that you can then use in, in a variety of programs to build a geological model. <coughs> um, you know, you can look at your core here, uh, multiple core boxes, uh, and you can see you know, changes in, 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 in the rock type uh, just on, on, on in the color image. Uh, this is a hyperspectral version of that, so we're looking at a number of different minerals. We're looking at a mineral class map. We can see we've got chloride-dominated assemblages up here. Uh, in the red, there's kaolinite-dominated assemblages, and that tells us what is happening in terms of alteration within, within, the, within the rock, within the ore body. The data also comes out as, as Excel files that you can pull into your geological uh, modeling software. So you're getting percent of things like chloride, illite, epidote, phlogopite. You know, from a mineral processing point of view, you might want to know kaolinite, montmorillonite. Uh, talc is another mineral that can be a problem in processing. But what we also get out of there is uh, here we're measuring the illite wavelengths. So it's the, it's the, it's, it, it corresponds to the chemistry of illite uh, uh, and as it changes, as it becomes more potassic, it moves in one direction. Uh, the other parameter here we're measuring is crystallinity, which is r related to thermal regimes within the rock. And so what we're able to do with this, with this elite wavelength is use that as a vector to ore. So in a number of ore bodies, for example, we have, a, we have a, I think, one of the largest uh, research programs in uh, minerals in Canada called uh, Footprints. And the object of this is, if you were outside an ore body, you'd want to know where, where, where is this ore body, because you know, geologically you don't often know where this is. So they've done some tests in three ore bodies. One was Canadian Malartic, uh, which is a big gold deposit up in, up in Quebec. Just looking at the illite uh, chemistry, you can, you can find a vector, you can find a direction to the ore looking at that. And this chemistry changes. As soon as you hit the ore body, it changes substantially. And when you're at the center of the ore body, it becomes very phengetic. So uh, this, is, this is a great marker for, 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 some, for, for a particular ore body. Uh, it's been used, uh, the other ore body that they tried was uh, Highland Valley in British Columbia. That was the tech. And you can see this 22 kilometers out. That, that is incredible. Just using mineralogical vectors, you can see where this ore body might lie. Because the fluids that have passed through the system have left a mark, and that mark is reflected in these mineralogical changes. So that is the power of the system. So we're using uh, mineral chemistry and crystallinity to tell us something about thermal conditions and what directions fluids might have, might have uh, moved in. Oops, again. Uh, this is a uh, mineralogical data log from CoreScan uh, in an iron ore prospect in Western Australia. And we've got some basic iron ore minerals, hematite, gerthite, martite, kaolinite. The, the clays are a problem in mineral processing. But what we were able to do is break down the hematite into multiple varieties, some of which are recoverable and some of which are other. So the mineral processing engineer very quickly has an idea of what is what, what he's going to, or she's going to be able to recover in, in, a, in a particular uh, area of their mine. Uh, this kind of gives them kind of a road map to, as to what they might expect and, and allows you also to forecast what your production might be. We, we've done, we do production forecasting in a number of mines where 
in one mine in particular, you know, you've got to fill the rail car, which has got to fill the ship, so you've got to be able to extract a certain amount of iron ore, and you've got to be able to predict it. These, this type of data would enable you to sort of be very precise in how, you're able, how much you're able to extract. Um, so that's kind of geometallurgical forecasting, which this would be the basic information to feed in, into that type of system. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a large scale uh, depiction of uh, the minerals that are in that copper porphyry that I showed you earlier. And it just shows the gradation. It's going from, you know, um, advanced argillic alterations. So you've got minerals like kaolinite, alunite, and then you get a lot more potassic, potassium coming into the system because of these types of alteration that are going on. And those types of patterns are, are very important to, to understand because in many ore bodies, it's not as simple as this. There are faults that disrupt the the, the, the progression and move them in different directions. And to be able to reconstruct that, it's very useful to have these types of maps so that you can understand where it is you, you're, you're going to put your next hole down to, 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 to find uh, some more. I uh, uh, just wanted to show this because you know, this is what gives us mineral chemistry. So we're seeing a shift in these absorption peaks and so we're going from calcite, which is a lot of calcium in there, to dolomite, which has got a lot of magnesium. And those changes, again, become quite significant in, in some ore bodies, particularly in, in, say, in the Abitibi. You've got iron-dominated systems where it becomes important. Uh, this is a very, very complex slide, but it, I, I just left it in because just wanted to you know, show you that you can get some very complex data out of it. And, it shows you these shifts for minerals like muscovite, illite, montmorillonite, where the peak shifts, uh, and they're shown here from, say, 2185 nanometers to 2225, uh, tell you something about uh, where an ore body might lie. And as I said, the one in Canadian Malartic, when you're outside the ore body, you're somewhere in, in here, where you're in the middle of the ore body, you're right in here. So the, this chemistry tells you where you might be in an ore system. This is the depth that gives you crystallinity. The broader it is, the less crystalline the material. Um, and that tells you, you know, if it's very broad, it's a low temperature type system. But there's also important information for a mineral processing engineer because what we see in a number of systems is veins where it starts off very crystalline and then it becomes much less crystalline in the center of the vein, that, has, that causes a problem potentially in your mineral processing circuit because this less crystalline material can grind very finely. It forms a slime that coats grains and, and may impact your, your flotation. So what we're trying to do uh, is we, we just take this raw data and see how it correlates with, uh, mineral with the results from mineral processing. So we're not necessarily interested in what minerals there are, we just take raw data and build up correlations using a variety of geostatistical systems and then use that to predict what might be going on. So that's from the mineral processing side of uh, things. Um, so, you know, this, this, this simple spectra gives you a number of other measurements that you can then use for your whole body characterization. Uh, I threw this one in because it's a, it's a Greenstone from from Africa, very similar to what we have in the Abitibi, uh, where a lot of gold systems. Very difficult sometimes to log this, um, but what we were seeing in this particular one, which was logged as not having any alteration. In fact, there's multiple alterations. You know, you've got selvages of calcite along the edges there. You've got silica. You've got smectites and chloride. You've got veins of calcite that you can't see. But critically, what you had was chloride, which was magnesium-rich chloride in the, in the light green, changed to an iron-rich chloride, uh, and that was directly correlated with, with gold. So you could build your grade shells on the basis of this. So, you know, in, you don't necessarily have to measure the gold. You, you, you know where you are in a system just based on the chemistry of the chloride. Um, and so that, that is the power of some of this, this hyperspectral data. Um, this is another interesting response. You know, this was a carbonatite, uh, and what we're looking at here, so carbonatites are, are a magmatic 
system. They're cousins to kimberlites that bring up diamonds, but they're composed mainly of, of carbon and calcite. Uh, and they've been mined for niobium. So, uh, but what they also have is, is a lot of rare earth in them. And everybody's very keen to find sources of rare earth. What we see with the rare earths is a dis direct response uh, from the element. So certain rare earths have a response in the hyperspectral <coughs> space. Uh, and we have things here uh, like uh, neodymium, samarium, and Euro europium. So we built a map of that response. And we, so we're directly able to map uh, the rare earths within this, within this ore body, <coughs> correlate it with uh, carbonate chemistry. So I said blue is magnesium rich, uh, uh, red is more calcium rich and then correlate it against with crystallinity <coughs> of the carbonate. And you know, what you're able to tell as a geologist is that this rare earth crystallized fairly l late in the sequence with the less crystallized carbonate. So it tells you a lot about the distribution of rare earths. Uh, so basically, you know, there, there are a few companies out there that have started to incorporate this. One of them is Newcrest. Uh, it's become very much uh, the key technology which they use at the exploration uh, sites, at their mines. Uh, and you know th they've worked out this workflow. This is Anthony Harris uh, from Newcrest. He, he calls this uh, petrography on steroids because of the volume of data that you get out of it. And <coughs> so at a drill site, you might have high-speed scanning, which is doing three, 400 meters per day. And you know in, in all of the sites that we've been on, so in, in, in Canada, we've been able to keep up uh, ahead of the rigs in terms of what we were able to scan. You get real-time data delivery, so the geologists are able to complete their logging on, on the core that has just been drilled. And that is fed into their geological software, so they're, they're uh, updating the geological model overnight uh, and, and able to make decisions as to where they're going to be drilling uh, shortly after. So their targeting is much improved. But also in a, in a mining situation is what is coming to, to the mine, you know, uh, uh, to, to the processing circuit rather. Uh, you know, it could be something that, that is clay rich, that is swelling clays that might gum up your flotation circuit. And you'll be able to take steps to avoid that, that type of situation. Um, and, you know, we, we depict, we show the data on these uh, uh, core table viewers with a touch screen. Um, and what it has led is a lot of collaboration, collaborative work around the table. So the geologists, say they're based in Brisbane and the, the drilling is happening in, a, in one of the South Pacific Islands, are able to look at the data in real time shortly after it's been drilled, make decisions as to what might happen in a specific situation. You know, and if they have to justify uh, spending money on other drill holes to senior management, they can show that to them right away. So, you know, you can have a geological team dispersed around the world and still collaborate uh, with this uh, on this data, which is in that cloud-based solution. So, essentially, what they found is it's reducing their risk of exploration and also reducing the cost of mining because you're avoiding um, all these deleterious minerals that might be present. It's bringing about faster cycle times um, and and leading essentially to savings in your exploration program. Um, uh, this was uh, uh, last last summer, which was uh, you can see the, the unit uh, in the high Andes. It was on a barrack project, uh, and they had a discovery there at Alturas. And essentially, you know, in a very very complex geological environment uh, where there were multiple uh, fluid systems, they were able to figure out you know where where the ore zones were and do that very quickly. Um, So that's where the technology is now, this continual development. Uh, a lot of these developments have come from feedback from, uh, from the teams, with the geological teams we were working with. One of these is the addition of a thermal infrared unit so that we expand the range uh, to 12 millimeters and what some of the minerals that we are not able to uh, distinguish well, things like quartz, things like felspars, individual felspars, we'll be able to do that with the thermal unit, but there's a whole range there from 
100 nanometers to 7,000 nanometers where we don't know what the responses are going to be like. So, you know, this is very much sort of cutting edge uh, uh, technology in the sense of what we are able to recognize and what we're able to do with that data. Um, we are looking at the addition of XRF modules, so that would give you uh, a degree of chemistry that you can then also use to control what is going on within your core, uh, and particularly for understanding distribution of sulfides, which again, infrared technology does not do very well. And other things like vein detection, structural quantification. So if, you, or if your core is oriented, you'll be able to figure out the direction of veins and actually import that data into structural uh, models uh, directly. Um, so just to conclude, you know, this is an easy to use mobile and cost effective technology for very detailed mineralogical mapping mainly. Uh, I have to say that the, the spectrometer design is, is, is really something that is uh, exceptional because it's, uh, it's getting all of these various signals and it's co-registered to the to a single point, uh, it, it is as well a very high signal to noise ratio, something like 2,000 to 1. So we are able to image very dark rocks. But what is also very important about this is there's an incredible piece of software that is able to take all of these spectra and process them very quickly. So that software and hardware sort of combination give you a very, very powerful system. Uh, and then you, 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 sh you put this out through Core Shed to make it sort of easily uh, viewable by by uh, team, it's generating big data so that <laughs> you can make decisions. You know, on much more information. You know, if you if you build a mine on grade alone, you can run into a lot of problems. But you're going to get all kinds of additional information to match your your assay values to be able to make uh, proper decisions as to how you're going to construct a mine and what it is you're going to mine, and and actually reduce the risk significantly by doing that. And you know. We've shown that it's, that, that it's uh, um, saving money both in, in mining situation and in exploration. And, you know, and, and in these times where <laughs> the mining industry and the exploration industry have been under pressure for you know, wasting a lot of money maybe over the years, you know, this is one way of coming up with a uh, uh, much more efficient way of uh, uh, exploring and of, of, of mining as well.